Hello everyone, this is Defense Politics Asia and uh, this is the summary for the day of 775 for the 8th of April. So this is somewhat of a delayed uh, posting or delayed telecast. So it's going to feel a bit different. Uh, we're going to be a, mo a bit more relaxed and uh, slow down and really look at the front line. And the front line changes report has already been out. I believe many of you guys have already watched it. So uh, we're going to go to, into the strategy and tactical reporting. And uh, we, first thing first, we, of course, we will always go, uh, not always, but we'll, we'll go by the anti-clockwise direction into the southern front at the Kherson front. Uh, so there is still fighting uh, being reported in the uh, southern bank of the Dnipro River. Uh, no, uh, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry did not really mention uh, where the fighting is. So as usual, we will mark it at Krinky. There is a dual location uh, of a self-propelled gun getting destroyed <clears throat> near the village of Nadizivka. So that's about it in the Kherson front. At the uh, and then uh, just near Nikopol, uh, south of Krivire, there is an S three hundred getting destroyed uh, by a cluster munition of salt. Some a, a very big explosion, probably. <clears throat> by a missile strike, some kind of, probably Iskanda or something. And uh, this explosion is massive. You can see the huge uh, class fragmentation in the perfect you know, round uh, fragmentation uh, uh, effect, which means that uh, the explosion is a bit higher uh, and then uh, the, e the equipment is destroyed. So uh, it's interesting because uh, we haven't seen S300 uh, for a long time. So it's a surprise to me also that the Ukrainians still have the S300 operating. But uh, moving position uh, around here, so near to the front line, we are talking about only 40 kilometers is a little bit too near. Um, but then the Ukrainians do not have really much choices because now that the Russians are using uh, glide bombs, the glide bombs, the fat, fat bombs, uh, as they can release the bomb much further away, I think the S three hundreds have no plot, uh, no, no, no choice but to deploy much nearer to the front line, and uh, that also becomes a easier target for the Russians to take out. At the Zaporizhia front, uh, this is Zaporizhia city. At the Zaporizhia front, uh, there is reports of fighting uh, reported towards Stepove, as well as in the northwest of Robove and uh, at Robotine. You probably can't see, yeah. Too much, too much uh, front, too much uh, this uh, entrenchment around here. Uh, there is a uh, report of bombardment and Pelivka at Pelivka, according to the Russian Defense Ministry. So these are the um the the, the various places with uh, with uh, some actions. But according to the Russian Defense Ministry, uh, it seems like uh, these are just a uh, positional war. Uh, that means static. Uh, they're just firing at the Ukrainians. They're not really doing assault. They're not capturing ground. It looks like they have no intention of you now retake or, or take the Orekhiv, Orekhiv sector or actually retake the entire of this uh, salient uh, that the Ukrainians have taken during the counteroffensive. So, uh, yeah. So I think this actually works in Russians' favor. Despite the Russians are actually still pushing uh, slowly, in the northwest of Verbove, but um, this creates a massive uh, logistical problem for the Ukrainians because if the Ukrainians want to hold the ground, they'll have to keep sending reinforcement to the front line and uh, putting themselves at risk from the Russians that can fire from all directions. So um, this is the main uh, problem for the Ukrainians. Uh, and the Ukrainians, they sacrifice so much to capture this ground. No, this area here, uh, this area is they sacrifice so much to capture all these things. Entire brigades has been lost for this little bit of land. I think uh, it is it's going to be really a hard division uh, for any commander to say just you no know, retreat to a more strategically uh, easier place to defend. Uh, so this is one thing that constantly plagued the Ukrainian uh, forces because they they have been too obsessed with uh, holding ground. Uh, or not measuring the frontline changes, or or where the, how much they have uh, retaken, or how much they have captured or lost. Um, of, of course, that's the whole purpose of the frontline changes report. But uh, when you come to the strategic uh, strategic situation, this creates a unenviable situation for the soldiers on the ground because they have been they have they are constantly sent to the to a line where it's 
so far away from uh, the support bases, uh, it's just difficult. And then uh, along the way, they, they can be you know victim to FPV drone strikes, Lancet drone strikes, and then of course uh, other kind of fire from ATGM to airstrike to you know, um, it is just um, difficult. I mean, if if you look at the Russian uh, situation, <clears throat> they they did this massive uh, redrawal from the northern front when they know that uh, they don't have the enough they don't have the troop numbers uh, to hold the front line during those days. This this front line around uh, in the northern front, they, they, they don't have what it takes to hold it, so they gave it up. Uh, of course, they used the guise of you know, being goodwill uh, during the, the during the Istanbul uh, agreement, you know, the peace deal. But they also, I'm 100% tell, I'm sure, the Russians know the deal will not go through. It's obvious. Ukraine was prepared for war. So, you no, know, and then the rhetoric have not changed during those days. So the... The Russians already know that that will, that deal is not going to go through. Any any people who have experience in a diplomacy or you know have been observing diplomacy at work, geopolitics at work, knows that is not the case. It will not happen. The same thing happened uh, in terms of the redrawal where the Russians uh, redraw from the Kherson front. They have basically something like this, and uh, they redrew everything down to the southern part of the Dnipro River. The Russians are willing to do all this kind of thing, despite the PR hit, you know, the boost, the enemy's morale, uh, and then, the, of course, the, the hit on their own morale, they would dis they actually smash their own morale because a lot of Russian soldiers died for all these places as well. You know, they, to defend or to capture all these places, a lot of people have died as well. So the fact that they are willing to do, to retreat, shows you know, the degree of flexibility, uh, the willingness to redraw. The same thing happened during the Kharkiv offensive, uh, the Kharkiv counter-offensive. Uh, according to the Ukrainians, I call it the Balak Balakliya offensive. At that time, uh, the Russians are holding you no know, uh, this line into Izium and something like this. So this entire area, the Russians basically redrew from this entire massive amount of areas. Uh, Yes, it came as a Ukrainian thought after they break through Balaklia, they spread out uh, in these directions uh, to a Chuhuif and everything. So that, that oh, I think the line was like this, sorry. So this, so the, the, the Ukrainians did break through, but the Russians did not throw guys at the, at the enemy to hold the line. They basically did a mass redrawal, very fast redrawal. Troops when they were sent in was just to do uh, protection, uh, to, to protect the retreat. And and then everything just redraw. And of course, the reality of the of those times was also that the Russians did not have troops on the ground. They do not have enough troops. Uh, the mobilization has not happened. The contract troops have all been redrawn. In fact, when the Balaklia offensive or the Ukrainian counter-offensive at Kharkiv happened, there wasn't much of Russian troops actually on the ground. Not not much. Most, everyone, all, all the front line was actually held by the Donbass militias, the volunteer forces. So, and, and of course, Wagner and some of these are Chechens, I believe. So, but the Chechens are not much during those days as well. They have already rotated out. So, the, so they, the Russians basically just redraw. They, they know they can't hold ground and uh, rather than having uh, troops dying uh, overly unnecessarily uh, they, they redraw and uh, and then you came the mobilization where the Russian forces quickly reinforced even without training so this is where you heard the news uh, the, the, the information from the pro-Ukrainian space talking about um, the, the Russians sending the mobilized troops without training despite they say that they will have two weeks of training or refresher they did not they immediately sent to the front was because of this because there was no troops on the ground they would they need to quickly send in uh, to ho help hold the ground and uh, while the Russians forces were as actually massive redrawing and the Ukrainians were giving chase in fact the, Ru the Russians redraw so fast the Ukrainians can't even catch them uh, because the Ukrainians have to you know beware mindful of uh, traps IEDs you no know, mines so they cannot move as fast as the Russians and uh, then then the volunteer forces started to hold the ground at Liman oh, sorry wrong color Liman, uh, they try to hold the ground around Oskil region, Krimki, and uh, this is where they try to hold the ground to wait 
to wait for reinforcement to quickly come so that they do not lose even more ground. And that's when the Ukrainians start to slowly break them down and um, break through through the center and uh, towards Kharkivka. And then the, the by then, when this breakthrough came on, Russian forces have already arrived at uh, Toske, Zereshne region, and they have sent reinforcement to Liman to help to the redrawal uh, from Liman. That's where the BAS-13, you know, the famous uh, BAR-13 volunteer force, was holding the ground at Liman and uh, at Novoselivka, Drobyshevi uh, region, and then they actually redraw out. So, so this is the kind of a uh, strategic and uh, flexibility or technical flexibility that's required to save men and uh, to, to allow you to continue to fight. And uh, a lot of people, of course, survived uh, uh, through, that, through this kind of situation. And um, however, Ukrainians have a totally different conundrum because they can't lose ground because it will look bad uh, to the international partners where they, they are required to get arms and ammunition from. So so the Ukrainians trying to hold, us, hold these grounds just get them stuck in this uh, terrible situation uh, where they have to go down this highway where they, they are constantly struck by FPV drone. Uh, this is already established by so many videos. And then they have to go through difficult places to reinforce the front line. Yeah, and then the Russians just keep airstrike and uh, no FPV drone strike them. So the, the this kind of uh, situation is really bad. Uh, but of course, even if you put me in the Ukrainian side, I'm going to have the same same problem because I don't think politically uh, Zelensky or any of the leaderships will allow the Ukrainian military to redraw. Because uh, the same rumors came out during the Battle of Bakhmut as well, where the Zaluzhny allegedly wanted to redraw and uh, Zelensky blocked it. So, and then threw Zaluzhny under the bus and said that you no, know, Zaluzhny recommended that the Ukrainian forces fight at Bakhmut which of course eventually they lost a lot of men damaging uh, their ability to you know do counter offensive uh, in the Bakhmut region and then uh, they or you know to to even hold good defense line they lost so much good troops there so and Russia just lost the Wagner which is uh, more expendable uh, from the eyes of the Russian leadership so at the Velikan Novosilka sector um, of the Donetsk front Russian forces continue their uh, Positional war over at Staromayovsky and Uruzaini, where they just continue to hammer from afar against Ukrainian troops. Um, there is a dual location of a uh, uh, RBK five hundred. I believe this a uh, this a, a guided bomb uh, airstrike on a Ukrainian position just southwest of uh, Shatasky. Uh, simply just show that Ukrainian forces are there. Is is not very important. Uh, nothing in the Voleda region over at this uh, Marinka sector. Russian forces uh, attack Krasnohorivka, uh, Georgievka, as well as Novo Mihailivka. And um, the, there's nothing special about the Georgievka and the Novo Mihailivka. The main thing is coming from Krasnohorivka. There is a super long three minute uh, speed up footage of uh, Russian forces storming into the south eastern part of Krasnohorivka. It's a very, very long footage. You can catch it at DPA Archive. Uh, you can search on YouTube DPA Archive and uh, you it's a super incredible video where the Russians basically attack in around 9 to 12 vehicles and then as as they penetrate through the, through the clearing, they started to uh, open up. And one of these force that was, uh, the drone was following actually landed troops uh, into these uh, buildings around here, whereas uh, there is other forces. They just open up, and and this makes it impossible or very difficult for the Ukrainian drones to follow, to to for the artillery people to shell correctly, accurately against you no know, forces coming from different directions. So there is possible possibility that the Russian land troops around here as one of this uh, force that was split out from the initial uh, punch. So. And then the this one over here is confirmed. So we will continue to monitor. This is the round two of the battle of Krasnohorivka. Round one was won by Ukraine as the Russian forces uh, salient, uh, or rather the foothold in the southern part of Krasnohorivka has been captured and uh, the Russian forces got kicked out entirely from Krasnohorivka. So that was round one. Uh, so this is round two and th this looks a bit more serious. And uh, the Russian forces uh, came out from 
from this region here they drove around this quarry and then go down this this uh railway line and quickly sp spin out and uh, actually land troops it, uh, it was pretty pretty fast uh it seems like a sudden attack the ukrainians did spot them so which is why there was a drone you no know, covering all this uh, this entire movement and then artillery ukrainian was launching artillery at the russian tanks it was pretty accurate accurate the artillery shelling uh, that means they are following the, the location the movement of the tanks but um uh, it seems like not enough of artillery shell uh the sh the number the amount of shelling is very low uh it looks like there is only one to two guns that was firing at the the tanks only one to two guns so if it's if it's only one to two artillery guns uh it's a bit low in terms of uh the amount of artillery you need to stop a uh, armored assault uh so we move into the dfk front and the dfk front uh russian forces uh, uh retook the initiative again uh i mean they already have the initiative but the ukrainians was doing a massive counter offensive uh to, to stop the Russian push, but the counter offensive has been uh, limited right now. Uh, the Ukrainians were is counter attacking at uh, Novo Kalinove and Badaichi. However, the Russian forces are storming into Novo Kalinove. They have allegedly captured most of Badaichi. There's attack at Semenivka, towards the west of Olivka, towards Umanske, towards the west of uh, Tonenke, north of Vodiam, towards Netalove as well as out of Nevelsky. So if you look at the, the, the this strategic mapping, you can see that uh, the situation is rather precarious with the main push coming out from this area here towards Umanske and uh, towards Netalove. And uh, this, this is the main push. So the in terms of the the most significant, of course, uh, based on the frontline changes, there is this uh, salient or this bulge that is uh, developing north of Odian. I don't think this is uh, going to be sustainable. Ukrainian forces is likely to redraw. We have Russian forces already pushing westward uh, from Tonenke and uh, they are slowly closing this gap. As well as, as uh, with the capture of Odian, Russian forces are pushing north from Odian. And uh, this push, if the Russians take this, then we will saw and saw so we will see an encirclement. So this is uh unlikely for the Ukrainian soldiers to want to hold at this position. They will try to escape. Uh now of course the fighting is now reaching Netalove. And of course the I mentioned the Russian forces can actually cut off uh the Ukrainian forces that is fighting at Povomaiske. So Povomaiske will not be uh so easily holdable. Of course, there is a lot of ground south of this uh, area the remaining northern part of Pofomaiske for the Ukrainians so it's not encircled yet uh, but definitely you know cutting off through the main uh, cutting on a uh, cutting off road access is uh would be a uh, very 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 inconvenient um the Badachi region is very weird because uh after we invalidated the Russian claims the Russians have a new claim that looks like this I mean it looks this is not what you think it, this is this is actually a stegosaurus no this is a stegosaurus yeah so 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 anyway uh the ukrainian forces got uh joe located to be airstrike uh at this location russian claims is until the lake region around here and uh is not really most of this uh, settlement uh, actually more south of it so they are attacking in this direction so but this is just a claim uh, this is based on russian mapping this cannot be trusted as it is uh, so we will continue to wait for further information uh, in terms of ukraine mapping the front line is here so so that we shall wait and see how this goes russian forces are still pushing into the, the center of semenivka so i mean i think the battle here is going to end pretty soon maybe a week i guess if uh if the ukrainians are doing well uh and the Nova Kalinove was a surprise as well. So in uh, yesterday's Sibra, uh, we, we saw the Russian forces attack in this area here. They were geolocated here and the Ukrainian forces uh, counter-attack and uh, probably recaptured most of this place. Uh, most of these are uh, furthest point that Russians have arrived. However, as the Ukrainians go south, the Russians hit on the from the other side. You know, like boxing you know, is a left fin, right hook kind of situation. And the Ukrainian forces, there's a Ukrainian position around here. And they will bypass they're getting bypassed by the russians from from around it and there is possible possible russian positions already south of this ukrainian uh, defensive position so this is going to be quite disastrous and it looks like uh some kind of a 
tactical play from the U from the Russian side. So I I find this super fascinating. And this is not the only front line that this this happened. The 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 same thing happened, of course, at Krasnohorivka. Just when the Ukrainian forces cleared the southern part where the Russians have the salience at Krasnohorivka, the Russians did this massive push into the southeastern part of uh, Krasnohorivka. So it, it feels like the same thing. It looks like the Russians are you know, becoming more and more tactically adept. Uh, so we will continue to watch uh, the war and see if this is actually the case uh, or this is just coincidence Be uh, because it's not easy to coordinate uh, this kind of uh, tactical uh, maneuver uh, where you try to feint uh, uh, or you know some people say this is like uh, the Russian uh, strategy of uh, uh, mascara <laughs> I forgot the term, though, Mastirovka or something, you know. Uh, yeah, you no, know, putting on mascara. So the as the Russians put on the mascara, the, the Ukrainians got duped into and then you know they fall for the the the, the trans uh, Russian. So anyway, um yeah, but the, you know, this is uh, uh we will continue to monitor and see if this is the case because uh, definitely with the reports coming in and out uh, on a daily basis, we will probably able to see, you know, if there is some kind of uh, tactics being involved because uh, for so far you russian don't have really a lot of tactics per se no their tactic is more like you no know, we they attack once they capture the ground they redraw and then but they booby trap the the places that they capture so when the ukrainians return to retake all those trenches they got hit by ieds hit by you no know, booby traps this is something that uh, is confirmed to me from the rush the ukrainian side fighters on the ground basically say that so the uh, so I mean, of course, the Ukrainians probably do the same thing, but the Ukrainians are more desperate about grounds, uh, about holding the ground, which I mentioned before. So they are more susceptible to such a uh, booby trapping. So anyway, at the uh, New York front, Ukrainian forces attack out from uh, New York again, but uh, this, of course, the uh, very small scale, uh, so nothing really to shout about. In the southern flank of the Bakhmut front, we have the usual thing: uh, Russian forces attacking at Klitschievka as well as Andreevka. So that's about it. Nothing much to talk about here. In the northern flank, uh, that's where all the actions is. You can see a huge amount of ground change uh, with Russian forces allegedly captured Bodenivka. This is claimed by a Russian source. This is not uh, announced by the Russian Defense Ministry yet. So allegedly Bodenivka has been captured. However, based on Ukrainian mapping, uh, if you have watched the Frontline Changes report, it seems like that is the... Uh, it seems to be pretty much the case, even with Ukrainian mapping. It looks damning, and Russian forces are pushing north of, uh, north of uh, Ivanivsky, uh, through the forest. So this is like a two-prone attack towards Chasivia. So this is the some kind of two-prone attack, a pincer of salt. While the Russians are, are holding this uh, front line over at Novi, where the Ukrainian forces is now, you know, sending forces and are probably probably reinforcement to ensure that the Russians do not break through. Then suddenly you have this uh, pincer developing from the north and the south. Of course, again, I do not know if this is static or this is just coincidence. Uh, this is just a full frontal assault that end up, you know, some parts, you know, got further ahead, some, some parts got slower. And uh, but whatever it is, even this uh, area here that it was uh, claimed by the Russian side seems to have some kind of uh, acknowledgement by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry as they as they report fighting near Stuposhki. So Stuposhki is uh, this this town here. This is Stuposhki, and I suspect that Stuposhki actually stretched quite a bit. You no, know, maybe until here, uh, maybe until here. Okay, I don't know what monster is this. So anyway, the the Russian forces, if they are they are as per the Russian claims, uh, reaching near the canal, then fighting near Stuposhki does make some sense. So, but the Ukrainian Defense Ministry basically says that. So you know, yeah, because they said it's a they repelled attack. So this is an attack that can be repelled. It's not a fire attack. So it's not shelling. So the the Ukrainian Defense Ministry somewhat is acknowledging uh passively that the Russians have advanced from Ivanivsky. And uh, important to note is that Ukrainian Defense Ministry did not mention Ivanisky in their report about fighting. They seem, they they say Stoposhki, but no Ivanisky. So, which means that the Ukrainians have acknowledged that 
Ivan Niski have been captured by the Russian forces. And uh, there is also geolocation uh, of a Lancet hitting Ukrainian uh, tank south of Toposhki. So the situation is looking rather bad. Uh, if we zoom in a bit, uh, the Russian forces, according to the Ukrainians, uh, this is a uh, the Ukrainian claim this. The Ukrainian claim that the Russians have advanced in this area here. And uh, the grey zone, of course, stretch on uh, much further. So, which means that the entire forest is now uh, uh, in uh, in doubt for the Ukrainians. And which means that it corroborates uh, the possibility, the rumor of the redrawal west of Ivaniski reported by Ryba. So, the pro-Russian source reported this uh, rumor that the Ukrainian forces have redrawn from the western part of Ivaniski to the uh, west bank of the canal. So, so with this uh, map change, it looks like this is semi corroborated, you know, somewhat corroborated. And uh, over at this uh, Bodanivka region, Ukrainian mapping actually shows that the Russians have taken like this. There is this punch suddenly in the western part of Bodanivka. This is uh, unable to be refuted because there is video geolocated the Russian forces on this location. But the Ukrainians did not want to acknowledge that the Russians have taken this center area here of uh, Botanivka. However, the according to Russian mapping, they, they are super far. They, the Russians have taken this forest line. They have taken these buildings around here, taken the southern, some part of the southern part of this forest. Um, yeah, and also kept, uh, declared the capture of Botanivka. So this is a, a huge changes and the fighting is now at Kalanina. So this the Battle of Kalanina have begun uh, if the Russian claims are correct. So we will wait and see, uh, we will monitor and see if this is the case. And uh, we move on at the Sivas front, Russian forces are attacking Bilohorivka, Vokomokayamske, as well as Prane. So that's about it. This is a strategic situation. In terms of Bilohorivka, the fighting is coming from uh, around the chalk quarry, the chalk quarry. Uh, which is here. The chalk quarry area is very, very, very heavily defended. It's a basically a small, it's some kind of a hill. Uh, so no, it's very difficult and very, very heavily defended. The Russians have bombarded it, uh, bombard this area many, many times. Uh, it doesn't seem to destroy the Ukrainian forces over there. Over the criminal front, Russian forces are attacking a tourney as usual. Nothing special about this. Uh, moving on, nothing has fed away. Uh, over at the Kupians front, Russian forces attacks in Kivka. The Zagoryo Kivka uh, fighting is not being reported anymore. So that's probably just probing attack. And that's it from, from the Kupians front. There is only one attack reported at the border regions. Basically, there, there is this uh, strike uh, by the Russian forces on a Ukrainian uh, tank, a train. So this train carries uh, fuel. The, the, it's a train with uh, a lot of uh, fuel, fuel, what is it called, cars. The cars that carries the fuel. And uh, so it looks like this uh, caterpillar over here. You can check this out on the DPA archive. Um, and then, so this is a fuel facility over in this uh, south eastern part of uh, Kharkiv. You can see there's some fuel storage around here. And uh, the destruction of the train is here around here or here so so the this strike basically hit uh, there's a direct hit onto the train and then the train exploded and then uh, there's fire and whatnot so i'm not sure what's the equipment used for this strike it could be an airstrike the train is stationary so uh, it is not a difficult hit uh, if you have accurate weapons. So anyway, this is the summary for the day of 775 for the 8th of April. Of course, uh, the 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 fighting on the 9th of April is ongoing. In fact, uh, they might have already starting to go into the 10th of April. I'm not sure what's the Ukraine time right now. Let me check. Ukraine time uh, is 10 p.m. So it's still in the 9th of April uh, in Ukraine. So this, uh, the of course, situation is developing. I did not report anything on the 9th of April. So this is everything 8th of April. Uh, so this, so basically go through because the, what happened is that uh, I posted the frontline changes report. The YouTube is pushing it. So it was good. The viewership is decent. It's good. Uh, I mean, comparing to uh, the v the views that I'm getting is actually very good. So I did not want to throw in a zip wrap and uh, disrupt this uh, trending of the video. So I have to let it run, which is why the zip wrap 
uh, we do a delayed way, a delayed one. But I think a delayed one also give me less stress because I don't have to rush for time. Because of course, uh, usually I want to rush quickly, send out the report so that you no, know, you will be timely. Uh, but since that uh, we already have the frontline changes report out, so I can actually post this uh, slip wrap slower, where we actually go into details about what is what has happened over the past twenty four hours, or rather the the last day, and uh, the latest. Uh, because I don't really go into doing uh, breaking news uh, because breaking news tend to be a lot of false information so I don't want to go into breaking news uh, but we, we go into details talking about all the various issues and the various front line and the tactics and whatnot so I think uh, let me know in the comments if this is a good format and um, yeah I will see how this uh, how this goes I will adapt accordingly anyway thank you for watching do press the like button subscribe I'll see you guys in the next update